on any of those items. And we, at the end of the meeting, we'll listen to 4.5. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you, Director LeHue, for polling item 4.5. <laughs> I really appreciate it, and it is uh, for the benefit of everyone that you did so. Thank you. I want to um, just point out that in um, 4.3, it says on page 17 that Director LeHue on April 16th of 2024 uh, assigned staff to come back on October 15th, 2024 to assess the next planned rate increase. Um, I, I would like some uh, explanation about that. Um, I remember hearing during the budget preliminary budget hearings, which unfortunately were not videoed, um, but I remember there was some confusion about whether or not the rates had gone into, the new rates had gone into effect and and why the amounts being shown were, were high. And um, I, I think that that's why that um, assignment to have a public hearing um, or a board meeting on October 15th of this year to review that. So I, I would appreciate clarification on that, and I know a lot of people would because of the rate increases that have gone into effect. Um, I also want to uh, point out, also in item 4.3 on page 18 during the, in the operation maintenance that uh, Director Jaffe asked way back August 18th, 2020, for a report on the um, water transfers with the city of Santa Cruz. That's not... Pure water SoCal transfers, as you'll hear more about tonight in the optimization, but this is the surface water transfers during wet winters. I would appreciate that being kept uh, current and discussed regularly because it is an important piece of our water supply. Thank you. And thank you, Becky. You can clarify, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify why, that I, why I asked for that, and that is just that even though the rate increases or the rate, the rates study and um, I guess the rate um, plan is all approved, I wanted to be able to assess whether we need to go up the entire percent that's recommended or once we look at the budget and the income, can we lower that? Okay, that's all. It was a, I wanted a moment to assess what we really needed before they went into effect. And I agree with that. <clears throat> and in terms of the water transfers, I'm totally fine with, with staff determining the best time to bring that back. Okay, um, so any other public comments? Any any uh, discussion or I'll move motion? Approval. I'll move approval of the um, items that were not removed. I'll second. I'll second. All right, I think we have to do a roll call. It's Director Balboni's remote. Aye. Oh, no. <laughs> Director Balboni. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Vice President Lather. Yes. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. President Jaffe. Yes. Okay, so that brings us to oral and written communications. It's an opportunity for public members to speak on any items of interest that are not on the agenda within the jurisdiction of the district. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I want to um, remind your board, um, well, first of all, let me start with some good news. <laughs> The um, Department of Water Resources, I'm sure you saw it um, yesterday, released a um, historic 2023 water year delivered big boost to California's groundwater supplies. I have a copy of that article, and uh, it, it is a good article. It predominantly refers to the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley. But I'm sure that uh, our area also saw some, not... Of course, not related to snowpack, but we did have some good rains. And I would like to ask that um, st uh, you request staff to um, 
perhaps do a tie-in, because this is in the news a lot, to do a tie-in with what uh, groundwater levels in the um, SoCal Creek Water District area, or perhaps this is an issue for the Mid-County Groundwater Agency to do, but I would like to request that. The second item, and I will give this um, to the, the clerk. Thank you. And ask that it be put in the record. Um, I also... I am bringing to you a reminder of the litigation Mr. John Cole uh, was successful in uh, determining with a Santa Cruz Superior Court that charges for uh, services that are not rendered are not legal. And this pertained back in, this is case 17CV00689. Um, the district was charging for the service of having a 123 TCP treatment plant that did not exist. And uh, Judge Paul Burdick agreed with Mr. Cole that that was not allowed. He did not ask the district to return any of the money that had been illegally collected. And so um, I would like to know where that money is, if there is any left. And I would like to ask that it, there be an accounting and that if there is money left, it be applied to the 123 TCP plant and uh, hexavalent chromium. I'll give this to the clerk for the board as well. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask, especially in light of the very large um, board packet tonight, that um, I have made this request before, but I will make it again, that there be a, an agenda with hyperlinks to the different agenda items. This would be especially useful in tonight's agenda that is uh, very, very large. And it is an easy thing to do and is something that Director Lee Hugh, when he sat on LAFCO, uh, asked for and they did. I would also like to ask that all Pure Water SoCal construction project Thank updates you, be in Spanish. Thank, Thank you, you, Becky. All right, are there any comments from board members? Or, or, sorry, one more. Sorry, I didn't see you, Marilyn. Go ahead. That's all right. Um, last week and prior to that, you've been discussing smart meters. What is omitted is often what is most significant. And for people to be able to give informed consent, they have to know all the ramifications of something that is being imposed on them. I'm going to read from this because people need to know. So-called smart meters, this is from Stop Smart Meters, and I'd like to remind you there is no safe amount of radiation, whether it's nuclear radiation or microwave radiation, from all these devices. Some other sources of information are bioinitiative.org, cellphonetaskforce.org. And Tom, I just gave, uh, submitted something for you about racehorses dying at Churchill Downs. You may have heard in the news. They had all these sensor microwave emitting devices on these poor creatures. Uh, which is a huge factor in them dropping dead. Makes me so sad. Um, smart meters, costing you money, risking your health, privacy, and safety. What are smart meters? Any electronic utility meter, usually wireless, allows utilities, third parties, and governments access to detailed information about your home life, emits radio frequency radiation and dirty electricity linked to environmental and health problems, can catch fire, explode, and damage appliances, increases utility bills. Many communities are rejecting smart meters, ordering safety recalls, and replacing with analogs. However, utilities continue to mislead the public and install without a mandate using coercion, extortion, and propaganda to achieve their aims. In fact, in 2015, right here in Capitola, in the housing project near Jade Street, 
some of the smart meters uh, caught on fire. I was able to visit the home and see it. This is a big problem with, with fires. Um, I'll leave you with this. I'd like to see some of these at the office where people can pick them up be, so they can be informed. That's a basic right in a democracy that people are informed of what's going on so they may, can make wise decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Now, are there any board members who have any uh, commun oral communications? No? Do you have any? OK. I, I have one quick item, and that, that's um, last meeting we were talking about the rebate program on whether to uh, simplify and reduce the rebates. And it just so happened I was uh, talking with a neighbor who told me about uh, a device that was installed in his home, actually multiple devices. He redid his, his plumbing that uh, does what WaterSmart does, but does it real time and does it in, in much more of a granular way where it has um, information from all the different fixtures. And it also has um, automatic cutoff. It, it, it basically learns your behavior. And if it detects a leak, it sends out a warning or, you know, that you about a leak. And then, and let's say you're, you know, vacationing somewhere Whatever, it, it will automatically cut off the water. So I think uh, probably not a lot of our customers would 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 do that, but there'd be some and I'd like to encourage them with a rebate or something like that. So and um, anyway, that's all I have. So as President Jaffe, can I just make one comment related to the accessibility of the packet? I did just want to comment that um, the way that the packet is prepared, we do have bookmarks, so it does have hyperlinks to the different agenda items. And Shelly, maybe you can just demonstrate on, on that one. If you go to the top left, there's a whole table of contents, and from that, you can um, just click on that to jump to certain sections of the agenda. Okay, thank you, Melanie. All right, so that uh, there's no reports, so we're now in administrative business, age 2687. Um, conditional, unconditional will serves, there are none. That uh, brings us to a, receiving a presentation on the Santa Cruz Mid County Basin Water Year 2023 annual report, and also to provide direct direction for the district's 2024-2025 water shortage stage evaluation and declaration. So this is you, right, Thank Cameron? You. It's, the, the, it's, it's oh, Cameron and I co-presenting okay. on this right. item. Um, Cameron is the district's hydrologist um, with Montgomery and Associates. So um, I'm going to start off with a brief background on the water shortage contingency plan, and I'm going to then turn it over to Cameron to give you um, the update on the Mid-County Basin Annual Water Year Report, which will help you inform or help inform your decision making for the shortage stage. So for background, the purpose of the water shortage contingency plan is to conserve and protect available water for all uses um, and to protect public health, welfare, and safety in the event of supply shortages. And as we show in table one of the plan, um, which is in the memo, um, the plan has six stages ranging from a 5% shortage up to an extreme shortage. Um, let me go to that here. Um, for greater than 50% um, uh, water supply shortage. Um, let's see here. The percent reduction that uh, goes with each stage is applied to a baseline water demand of 3,900 acre feet per year. Um, this evaluation focuses on two trigger conditions. 
We have groundwater conditions and rainfall totals. Um, the rainfall totals are correlated to groundwater recharge for the uh, prior five-year period. And while those aren't really the focus of, um, or well, the, not the focus of this evaluation, note that shortages can also be declared for more production-related or short-term um, emergencies. The district's currently in a stage three water shortage emergency due to groundwater conditions, overdraft, and seawater intrusion. However, um, no emergency rates for a stage three or any lesser stage are currently in effect. So I think um, what the data points to, and this is a spoiler alert, um, just to give you a heads up of where we're going, is that the groundwater conditions indicate that we're still in a stage three. Before turning it over to Cameron, I also want to note that our contingency plan is also part of the district's 2020 urban water management plan, which is updated on a five-year cycle. So the next one will, um, will start about this time next year. And so we'll be taking a look at that, especially in relation to Pure Water SoCal coming online. And that may require um, some different um, trigger conditions and and uh, shortage stage actions. Um, we'll just uh, have to see how that how that pans out. But I just wanted to let you know we'll be reevaluating that pretty soon. And so with that, Cameron, um, you want to take it from here with your presentation? Sure. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, directors, for having me. Um, it's my pleasure to present the conditions from the fifth annual report of for the Santa Cruz Mid-County Basin GSP. This is an annual requirement to report to the State of California Department of Water Resources, the status of the groundwater sustainability plan and groundwater conditions for the basin. So the annual report covers water year 2023, that's October 2022 through September 2023. Uh, that information is used for your consideration of the water shortage stage declaration. There's also additional information um, to consider from this water year that started in October, and we'll be sharing that as well. Much of this, much of this presentation was presented to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency back in March in advance of the submittal of the report that month prior to the deadline of April 1st for submitting the report to DWR. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll be covering a rainfall water year type for 2023 and then coming into uh, water year 2024 as well as water use for the last water year. Uh, discuss the sustainability indicator of seawater intrusion, which is the critical sustainability indicator for this basin. It's the reason why the basin is considered in critical overdraft and the reason why the basin has not achieved sustainability. Uh, we'll talk about that status for the water shortage contingency plan. Review the other sustainability indicators covered by the basin's groundwater sustainability plan, as well as progress on GSP implementation and go over the key takeaways from the annual report. Next slide, please. So for rainfall water year type and uh, water use, uh, rainfall, as uh, Shelley mentioned and is described in the, the board mem memo, uh, do have criteria for the water shortage stage criteria uh, declaration, um, water shortage stage declaration. Um, the pre precipitation in the last water year uh, was, did lead to a classification of the water year as, as wet. Uh, it was above average precipitation, almost 48 inches. Uh, water use was relatively low. It was the second lowest groundwater use recorded on record. Uh, the only lower one was back in water year 2019. Um, for This is for the overall basin, including district, as well as other groundwater users from the Mid-County Basin. For the evaluation of the water shortage water storage stage uh, declaration, uh, more up-to-date rainfall information is considered as will be described in the next slide, please. 
and that is to look at precipitation through March of 2024. So that is the first half of the current water year that is considered and a water year a rainfall for that first half of the year that is below average would lead to a stage one uh, curtailment that has not occurred this, this winter. Um, and then we look at cumulative rainfall going back uh, two years, three years, four years, and five years to evaluate whether rainfall would support a shortage stage declaration. You can see here in this table the criteria, the triggers for stage two and stage three. If rainfall over these time periods are below these amounts, it would trigger uh, these shortage stages uh, based off of rainfall. Uh, and none of these triggers, none of these criteria are met. Over the last five years, for each of these periods, there has been more rainfall than these uh, stage trigger levels. And rainfall does not support uh, continuing with the shortage stage curtailment. Now, the water shortage contingency plan uh, that looks at more than rainfall, as we'll go on to look at uh, groundwater conditions in the basin, specifically the seawater intrusion status that is evaluated for the water shortage contingency plan. And the way it's evaluated is consistent with how the groundwater sustainability plan evaluates sustainability, specifically for seawater intrusion, but in general, the GSP looks at basin conditions, comparing data to the sustainable management criteria set in the sustainability plan at representative monitoring points, which are generally uh, groundwater monitoring wells. And so for groundwater levels, which we'll be looking at, the idea to be sustainable is to have groundwater levels above the sustainable management criteria, both minimum thresholds and measurable objectives. For water quality indicators, it's generally to be below the sustainable management criteria. So comparing data to these levels that define sustainability and that is used for the water shortage contingency plan. Next slide, please. So for a summary of uh, seawater intrusion, seawater intrusion being the important indicator that defines the basin being in critical overdraft, there are two sets of criteria used. There are chloride concentrations, which show how uh, salinity is maybe advancing into the groundwater in the basin, chlorides representing uh, saltier water, and then also groundwater levels that represent uh, seawater intrusion risk. So for chloride concentrations, uh, looking at the data from water year 2023, there were five representative monitoring points that had chloride concentrations above the minimum thresholds defining, uh, defining sustainability. So these are considered at four of them because they had multiple exceedances, chloride concentrations above the minimum thresholds, considered undesirable results, uh, significant and unreasonable conditions for seawater intrusion. And this has occurred at a couple of the wells during both of the past two water years. And then um, one of the wells for the first time has had under, undesirable results. Next slide. As I mentioned, uh, seawater intrusion also looks at groundwater levels, a proxy groundwater elevations as sustainable management criteria for preventing seawater intrusion. Historically, groundwater levels in the basin have been too low. Uh, they have been low, which has been an unacceptable risk for eventual seawater intrusion. The groundwater sustainability plan sets groundwater levels that the basin needs to achieve to prevent seawater intrusion over the long term. Groundwater levels have been below these sustainable management criteria, these groundwater elevation proxies for many years, continue to be the case where seven of the 15 representative monitoring points have five-year average elevations below the minimum thresholds representing a long-term uh, risk, unacceptable risk of seawater intrusion based on the groundwater sustainability plan. And these occur, these undesirable results occur in all of the primary aquifers of, of the basin. And so these undesirable results represent a continued a lack of sustainability achieved in the basin. 
Next slide, please. And so the water shortage contingency plan looks at these results and based off of them, um, consistent with the declaration of a groundwater emergency, uh, assesses whether a shortage stage is, should be based off of groundwater conditions. And basically, if there are any undesirable results, if the basin is considered unsustainable, then a stage three is triggered. Uh, if there are many more representative monitoring points, higher levels of stages uh, would be triggered. Uh, it also looks at short-term conditions that are in the groundwater sustainability plan with a certain number of short-term conditions uh, leading to different shortages stages uh, potentially being declared. Next slide, please. So based off of desirable results, which if you have undesirable results, it means your basin is, is not currently sustainable. Uh, there are five of the 11 RMPs in the district. I should have clarified that this assessment is just based off of representative monitoring points in the district. There are also representative monitoring points outside of the district that this uh, shortage stage declaration does not consider. But five of the district's representative monitoring points have undesirable results based off of groundwater levels uh, needed to prevent seawater intrusion. And four of the 24 district representative monitoring points uh, have undesirable results based off of uh, chloride levels. And there is one well with both, um, one representative monitoring points with undesirable results for both groundwater levels and chloride levels. So there are eight unique uh, representative monitoring points with undesirable results. The board memo describes there being nine, so there's basically nine undesirable results in, in the basin, uh, but there are really eight locations, eight wells with, with undesirable results, uh, which should be compared to the uh, curtailment trigger levels. And uh, they, the number eight uh, is less than 10, and so uh, more than zero, uh, and that falls into a sort of stage being continued of a, a stage three, uh, stage three shortage. Looking at the other set of criteria considered for groundwater conditions, which are more short-term conditions with early management action triggers. And the next slide, please. Um, there are uh, several representative monitoring points with increasing chloride levels, uh, mostly in the seascape area in the southeast of the district. Um, that is an issue that the Mid County Ground and Water Agency has started to evaluate, um, as evaluated and identified pumping in the shallower aromas aquifer as leading to vertical migration and these chloride, chloride increasing chloride levels. And that assessment continues by the Mid County Ground Water Agency. And so that is the current early management action that is under being undertaken. Uh, there was also a district representative monitoring point that fell below the groundwater elevation trigger for short-term conditions. And that was very early in the water year. So since that early part of the water year, it has been above that groundwater elevation. Uh, the annual report describes ongoing monitoring as early management action uh, based off of the improved conditions that have taken place to make sure that um, those improved conditions continue. In any case, as far as the shortage stage decoration, uh, these uh, do not lead to a uh, more severe shortage stage than the undesirable results criteria do. Next slide, please. So basically, um, we'll move on to the other sustainability indicators, seawater intrusion uh, evaluation of seawater intrusion, groundwater conditions related to seawater intrusion supports uh, the stage three declaration as described in the memo. Going on to the rest of the annual report, uh, seawater intrusion is only one of five sustainability indicators that are relevant for the basin. Uh, there are four others, starting with uh, chronic lowering of groundwater levels, which is meant to protect the su groundwater supply for all beneficial users in the basin and based off of groundwater levels compared to the sustainable management criteria, there have been no exceedances of minimum thresholds and no undesirable results. So this indicator is considered sustainable for the basin. Next slide, please. 
Reduction of groundwater and storage is a, another indicator uh, that is really evaluated based off of total pumping. And it's an estimate of the amount of pumping by aquifer group that will prevent undesirable results for other indicators and protect the beneficial uses of the basin. Uh, it is considered, it is evaluated based off of net pumping. And as of now, the pumping is all gross pumping uh, and there is no managed recharge in the basin as of yet as projects have not been implemented. And as because of that, these pumping goals are not, these net pumping goals are not being met and these um, undesirable results for this indicator uh, exist. Next slide, please. Degradation of groundwater quality. Uh, there is another indicator to protect the uh, quality of the water for beneficial users of the base basin. There are several representative monitoring points that exceed the criteria minimum thresholds for parameters such as iron, manganese, total dissolved solids, and chloride. There are uh, no undesirable results, however, because these minimum threshold exceedance result from pre-existing conditions. And it's when uh, minimum threshold exceedance results from groundwater management that undesirable results uh, would occur. And that has not happened uh, today or not happening currently. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so the, the GSP sets, uh, the, the criteria are based off of drinking water standards, um, and the, the GSP describes uh, what kind of exceedances are undesirable results, and it does acknowledge that exceedances could occur because of pre-existing conditions, and those would not be considered undesirable. It's when the management of the basin, either by pumping for supply or other management activities result in an exceedance, would be considered undesirable and therefore um, an unsustainable indicator. Next slide, uh, next slide covers the, the final applicable indicator for the basin and that's depletion of interconnected surface water. Uh, the, there is a, a representative monitoring point along SoCal Creek, which has elevations below minimum thresholds. And that is considered an undesirable result and uh, right now an unacceptable risk of depletion of interconnected surface water uh, related to groundwater. Um, this is a criteria that we do expect to be reevaluated before 2030 based off of uh, based off of data that are being collected and further guidance from DWR based off of what the GSP set to prevent unreasonable uh, depletion of surface waters, there, this indicator is considered unsustainable. Next slide, please. So to summarize the status for the different indicators in the basin, for the three five applicable indicators, three uh, indicate um, a lack of sustainability, uh, while two indicate sustainability. So it does point to a need to generally decrease net pumping um, and raise groundwater levels to prevent seawater intrusion and prevent depletion of unacceptable depletion of, of surf, surface waters and leads to the need for some projects and management and actions to, to achieve that. Next slide, please. The annual report also covers the progress on GSP implementation in water year 2023. Uh, there was a lot of work done on filling data gaps in monitoring deep coastal aquifers and interconnected surface water. Uh, that work has been complete. Ongoing work has been to establish a integrated data management system for the groundwater data in the basin. Um, an implementation grant award of $7.6 million which will be covered more in the next item, uh, is also described in the annual report. Um, and then on to projects and management actions with continued water conservation and demand management. 
the development of the Pure Water Secure project and uh, further uh, testing and planning for the City of Santa Cruz Aquifer Storage and Recovery Project. So the key takeaways from the annual report, Water Year 2023, there were the chloride increases in the seascape area. And this is a subject for ongoing evaluation. As mentioned before, there was preliminary evaluation of the causes of that, um, but there is further evaluation of the gathering of additional information to try to figure out a plan for uh, preventing further increases of chlorides in those areas. A coastal protective groundwater level elevations uh, continue to be below sustainable management criteria, uh, resulting in an unacceptable risk of seawater intrusion uh, and a need to raise groundwater levels to achieve sustainability to prevent seawater intrusion, even as groundwater extraction was the second lowest uh, since 1985. So that were the key takeaways from the annual report. Um, I hope you have a chance to review the report in, in total and certainly would be glad to answer any questions now or as, as they come up based off of that review. Thank you, Cameron. Um, so Shelley would, so we should ask the questions to Cameron first and then sure. go back to yeah. the item. Did, are there any questions? Okay. No? I think it, it, extremely timely is Year that we started the, that we, we work on the, the aquifer recovery. It's been, it's been a long year. Yeah, we, we have seen improvement over time as the district has done, um, and the district's customers have done so much to, to reduce use and pumping in, in the basin. Uh, but we're also seeing that it, it hasn't uh, fully achieved sustainability. I have an open-ended question um, <clears throat> related. So there's, is there modeling that's being done now of the basin? Yeah, as, as part of the annual report, we update the groundwater model, the groundwater model of the basin annually to provide some of the information um, documented in the annual report. So that includes basically uh, Groundwater and storage calculations is the primary one. We we update the model with basically uh, data for climate, you know how much rainfall, and so we allow the model to ca calculate the recharge for the basin and data for groundwater pumping, and so we can assess basically uh, how the basin overall is doing beyond just the the data we collect. From, from the model. So it's, it's annually updated and it helps us with further evaluations like we'll be talking about in the next item. Can I follow up? Sure. Just open-ended question, any surprises as you do that update? Any surprises? Um, I, I don't think there have been any surprises with Maybe. that, Not, nothing. Nothing major. I, I think sometimes when you look, if when, if you go and look at the annual report, you will see some things that may you may not expect as far as where the greatest changes in groundwater and storage occur. Um, a lot of them actually occur in the upland part of the basin, and in some ways, what DWR is asking for is not as useful for this basin, which is so concerned with seawater intrusion. And your concern is with groundwater levels near the coast to prevent seawater intrusion, which could re represent relatively small changes in groundwater and storage because there are confined aquifers uh, that are underneath aquitards, while the bigger storage changes are in these areas that are unconfined and, and it's, it's just, you see these bigger changes on those maps. So I think as you review that, that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Tom? Um, a comment and then just a question. I'm just 
having watched how we've made these decisions over the last 20 years, it's come a long way. And I think it seems like so much more scientifically valid for setting a groundwater emergency. I mean, we, anyway, so I'm really, really appreciate that. Um, and then I was just wanted to, maybe this is a question for Shelley. Do we have a plan to somehow get a easily understood graphic of the progress or where we are with the basin and why we're at a stage three still in, in some kind of communication to our customers? Yeah, we, we normally um, update our website. We have a web, web page dedicated to kind of the stage three and what our shortage um, requirements are, what we're asking customers to do to comply with that stage three. So Would it have this kind of updated information about? Yeah, I mean, we could look at adding some graphics if, if that's kind of, if that's what you're suggesting. Yeah, I mean, I just think, you know, we, our goal is for people to be with us on this and, and understand what's, you know, what, why we are where we are and why we're working so hard to, to replenish the basin. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I guess, a question and kind of a request. Yeah. It, it, might or might not be easy to, to come up with something. I know. But I just, I've made the request in the past of, and had the idea of maybe having like a thermometer um, in front of the, the district officer, but instead of it being temperature, and it, it, it nothing that necessarily has to change quickly, just where we're at in terms of, of the, the health of the basin. I think one thing that we've done is break down what that percentage, 25% reduction means to individual households and, and people. And we've broken that down to about 55 gallons per person per day, um, just so that they have a guideline because percentages don't really, sure, yeah. you know, mean anything. Um, so I think we're, we're basically there. Um, we're down about, I think about 2,900 um, acre feet right now for the annual annual production. But it's going to take time for the basin to recover. Yeah. And Pure Water SoCal for it to recover. No. Oh, I'm done. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, in terms of relating the rainfall and the groundwater, you know, modeling and analysis. It's really nice to see that linked up a little bit, like compared. But um, I think the district always used rainwater as as a proc more of a proxy to see where we were. Because even I think as a, a commentator uh, made a, a point about uh, the, the high rainfall this year, but this rainfall wouldn't be tied to aquifer replenishment for a couple of years, actually. So the rainfall, that's where the rainfall became just a year-to-year -year thing. So my question was whether, I mean, how much, uh, how long will we continue to analyze and update the model and whether it would be available to be used as easily as a rainfall gauge <laughs> to determine what the state of the aquifer is? I mean, it, it's unquestionably more accurate, but is it? Usable for us to rely on that on a long-term basis. Are you um, since we do regularly update the model uh, information from the model results could be used to make assessments such as these. Uh, I do think that what is in place with looking at the undesirable results based off of groundwater level and quality data is an appropriate way to assess the, the conditions of the groundwater basin for decisions such as the, that is before you tonight. So, um, you know, those, those indicators are how the state and sustainable groundwater management ask, asks uh, the groundwater agencies to use to evaluate whether it's sustainable or not and I think are, are the most accurate ways to do it. You can supplement it with information from the groundwater model, um, but the data in comparison to the criteria based off of the data, uh, I do believe should be the priority. I would add, I, I think with the last urban water management plan, and I think that Shelley and Cameron both addressed it, 
that we have multi-criteria now. So there's those three conditions, groundwater conditions, rainfall data, and also um, consultation with our O&M department. So I think a combination of those three, and then I think spending the time to go over the annual report today to, to go through those um, indicators. I, I do like the ideas, how do we communicate that to our community? My mom always is the one that goes, oh, there's a lot of rainfall, so there's no water issues. Um, and even you know throughout the state, that's not always the case. So how do we distill uh, the information that Cameron just presented and get it to where um, our community can understand it? I think that's where hopefully our, our team of outreach um, can help both. I know the city of Santa Cruz is addressing that as well as us just in terms of our upcoming years and the kind of the conditions. So we have a test case, your mom. Your mom gets it. <laughs> We've got something. My mom and my aunt, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so public comment, I would say. Opportunity for anybody to make a public comment at this point. Thank you for that report, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, the rain is connected to the groundwater levels. Um, I remember hearing Mr. John Ricker report, he, he monitors his groundwater levels in his private domestic well. And he said when uh, we had a wet winter um, this last year, it, groundwater level rose two feet in his private well. So it is related. It depends on where you are in the county. and. Um, and to that end, I, I really think making available information from Mr. An Dr. Andy Fisher's recharge initiative showing those areas of the county that are good for absorbing the rainwater and, and recharging the, the groundwater would be of value and very good information on your website for those who are trying to understand this. Um, I heard in, in Mr. Tanner's report that the... Um, the district has uh, extracts 3,900 acre feet, and then I heard Ms. Flock say it's down to 2,900 acre feet. I would like to have some clarification. I remember hearing a few years ago at a presentation, it was actually at the Community Foundation, uh, it was determined that the district's usage was much lower than had been anticipated or a plan for at that time. Um, it's good news that this was the second lowest usage on record. That's excellent and speaks well of customer conservation. So I encourage the district to continue to encourage conservation. One surprise, the baby isn't surprised, is that um, the chloride levels in the seascape area, that is because those three wells, that triad of wells is from the uh, Ludorf and Scalmanini test wells that the district had drilled in 2008 to determine where the seawater salt freshwater level is. Um, and my last question is, I'd like reports on the nitrate and the ammonia coming from O'Neill Ranch well. Thank you. Please pay attention to the time. Thank you for that presentation. I wrote down some of the phrases you used about degraded quality, undesirable results. Um, I've been listening, and I really refer you to geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington about the global uh, weather intervention operations, some of which we've heard of recently. What is uh, not being tested in the water, and I don't think you can get it out from my understanding, are the microplastics, the nanoparticles, the geoengineering operations disperse I don't have the vigors in front of me, but it's a lot. Aluminum, barium, strontium, I don't know if it's mercury, 
these are undesirable results. What is being tested in the water? Can it even be to test it? It's like omission. We're, we're in deep trouble. I mean, I'm probably the oldest one in the room, but the water was not this degraded when we grew up as children with all the contaminants. Um, I myself was in a lawsuit to ban DDT with nursing mothers, 1969. We all had this contaminant in our breast milk. And at that time, you couldn't pick up an ocean bucket full of water that didn't have DDT contamination, 1969. Now there's so much more. How do we stop the chemical pollution in the first Thank place? Thank, Thank you. you, Marilyn. Um, okay. Did, did staff want to respond to anything? Or Cameron? Don't have to. I'm just giving you the opportunity. Okay. So... 100 acre feet per year is our baseline. That's our, our maximum demand um, in the urban water management plan and the demand okay. projection. So that's why it's used. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Um, so, Shelly, are, are we now going back to the, to the previous? Thank you, Cameron, for the. Thank you, Cameron. You're welcome. Um, the groundwater conditions are the only. Um, trigger that's been triggered, um, indicating we're still in a stage three. So um, staff is recommending that we continue with the stage three water shortage emergency with no rates. We have no emergency rates in place right now. And that's um, called for under resolution 1908. If the board did want to change that, then, um, you know, we'd need to get alternate direction and we'd need to come back at a subsequent uh, meeting with an updated resolution because 1908 is specific to where we are right now. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So do we need to take public comment on this aspect or have we already, that's included? Okay, good. So any further discussion by the board? Michelle, or any motions? I was going to make a motion to continue with stage three and no emergency rates. And I'll second. second. Oh, she beat me even remotely. Yeah. She was <laughs> so was moved and seconded. So roll call. Director Balboni? Yes. Vice President Leather? Yes. Director LeHugh? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. President Jaffe? I'm convinced by the information, yes. Yes, I think we should stick with the stage three and no emergency rates. Okay. So that brings us to 7.3, receive update of the Mid Santa Cruz Mid-County Regional Water Optimization Study. And that's you, Shelley, right? Yes, let me get back on track here. So tonight we have a presentation. Uh, Cameron and I are, are doubling up on this one as well. Um, it's about 40, 35, 40 minutes long, and I know we're running kind of late tonight, so we can try and accelerate it if, if that makes sense to you. Um, we can adjust. I know you want to. Well, yeah, it, whatever, you, whatever you think is we need to know okay okay and then let's just see this is kind of large here let me shrink it a little bit okay so first i'd like to start by introducing heidi lukenbach heidi is here tonight she's the santa cruz um, water department water director and uh, she's been integral to the optimization study on the city side and uh, Heidi, do you want to come up and say a few words? Thank you for coming tonight, by the way. Welcome. Hi, welcome. 
Um, it's good to be here. Thank you, Shelley. And I have a few things to say. First of all, congratulations. I think um, Director LaHue mentioned earlier that we've been at this. We've all been at this for a long time, you in particular. And I think I could not overstate the importance of the Pure Water SoCal project with respect to groundwater sustainability and supply reliability and the perseverance and dedication and momentum that you have demonstrated over the last 10, 20, maybe 30 years is just really impressive. And I think that word is even understating um, the work that you've all done. So thank you for that. Um, I do sit outside your organization and I like to think that we are um, team members and we are, but I've been able to make a few observations over the last 10 or so years. And I think these three things that really stand out for me are I think foundational to the success of the project and one is the leadership of the board and the leadership of the staff um, it just demonstrates a real commitment to the project and the um, sustainability of the base and not just for the district and the district customers but for all of us um, collaboration not not only amongst yourself but with partners like um, the city of santa cruz and central water district also at the state and federal level um, it's just so obvious that there's a real interest in solving problems, but doing it in a really collaborative way and kind of setting a framework for other agencies to do what you've done. Um, hopefully making it a little easier and a little bit shorter for others to come in your footsteps. And then lastly is transparency. I think I've really noticed all of your meetings, um, all of the public outreach that you do. It's really just in an effort, again, to show the community, your stakeholders, um, the regulators, the work that you're doing, and um, the value that the project is adding. So thank you and congratulations. This is really exciting to see this get this far. Um, to segue into the optimization study, I'm also really excited about that piece of work because it allows us, as you'll see tonight, to continue collaborating with the district. Um, many kudos to Shelley. This is a really complicated piece of work with a lot of consultants and a lot of facets, and I think a lot of, she brings a lot of patience, and a lot of her job as project manager is herding cats, and she does a great job um, at doing that, and I really appreciate that. Um, I made a comment last night at the Water Commission meeting that we're gonna look at, I think tonight as well, the number of alternatives that we've distilled it to, but she has worked with this group, with the modelers, to get from, I don't know, 5,000? scenarios down to I think five or six so um, you have a great staff and I really appreciate the ongoing opportunity to work with you all that's it thank you Heidi thank you okay. and we're going to the next page and thank you for coming tonight Heidi so tonight we're gonna um, I'm gonna give a brief background and then uh, some introduction to the optimization study. I know I've been covering it in my management updates for the last several months, but um, just give a little bit more information on that. And then Cameron is gonna talk about the groundwater modeling approach and the results. And then lastly, the next steps in schedule. So the Sigma implementation grant, Sigma being Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, um, this grant was uh, issued in 2022 to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency for our basin. It's a $7.6 million no-share, no-cost share grant from uh, DWR. And the purpose is to implement SIGMA as outlined in our basin's groundwater sustainability plan. Um, this grant was provided to all basins that are critically overdrafted to help accelerate um, the timeline for sustainability. There's five components to the grant, including um, the regional water optimization study, which is shown there as number four, component four. Um, they listed as technical development of GSP and management actions, and we, we call it the regional water optimization study. That's a joint um, component between the district and the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we are each handling different pieces of, of the project. Uh, the district is leading the overall 
uh, study itself, and the city is leading the groundwater modeling and contracting with uh, Montgomery and Associates and Cameron. So this uh, particular component is a $1.9 million grant. Um, funded, and you can see there there's a couple other district components. Um, component one, Cunison Lane groundwater well, and also component three, the Park Avenue transmission main and bottleneck improvements that are ongoing. Um, I think component three might be pretty close to being completed. Uh, Taj is uh, leading up those two components. And then component two is the city's ASR, aquifer storage and recovery. And component five is um, sustainable groundwater management evaluation and planning led by the County of Santa Cruz. The study's purpose, focus, and results. The purpose is to work collaboratively on a regional basis to identify and evaluate potential opportunities to optimize projects that have been identified in our GSP already um, to most effectively achieve and maintain sustainability and also to improve regional water supply reliability. And that bullet point is, is mainly um, how, do we, how do we help the city um, with their supply gap during um, drought, drought periods. The focus really is on um, those GSP projects that uh, are the most promising. There's, there's others, um, conservation and um, pumping redistribution that are really part of our, kind of our operations daily now anyways. So we're really looking at these projects that can help meet um, those goals of basin sustainability and uh, uh, help the city with a supply reliability. That includes the district's Pure Water SoCal, the city's ASR project, and then water transfers and exchanges between our two agencies. We've uh, already made quite a bit of progress with the modeling that's happened to date, and the results of that, just to give you a little preview of where we're going, uh, we've identified four potential projects that achieve sustainability and do improve the reliability. And those kind of provide, I guess, a spectrum of projects. Um, so we're, we're hoping to like bookend, basically. We're not locked into these four projects per se, but that's what we're carrying through our evaluation. A lot of the other projects feed into them as well. And there'll be a little bit more explanation of that um, in Cameron's presentation. I also wanted to talk about how the water optimization study um, fits into our partners, um, City of Santa Cruz's ongoing water supply planning process that's called the um, WASAP or the Water Supply Augmentation uh, Implementation Plan. And so this graphic um, shows that here in highlighted in red is the optimization study. So it is a component of uh, the larger uh, piece of work that the city is embarking on to address the supply reliability um, issue. They're also looking at opportunities to collaborate with other regional partners, the uh, Santa Margarita Groundwater Basin, as well as looking at some uh, standalone projects, direct potable reuse, desalination, and then uh, surface water transfers. And all along, we've been re really working hand in hand with the city to make sure that what we do for the optimization study matches up or is easily integrated into their work um, so that we're, we're really trying to be efficient with that and, and help um, kind of streamline uh, those two processes. The city has um, had a presentation last night to their water commission on the same topic, the optimization study update and their long-term um, planning as well. And some of the findings that were presented um, last night 
um, over you know the past 10 years of modeling and planning these are the conclusions that um, they've arrived at and that's one is surface water availability is limited due to climate change and the impacts on their surface water flows also they have habitat conservation plan uh, requirements to protect fish and those also impact the availability of surface water. The belts groundwater extraction um, without ASR does not meet the Mid-County Basin sustainability. And so ASR is, is definitely needed or um, something's needed to um, achieve sustainability. ASR project is limited by available surface flows and also by basin sustainability. And that Pure Water SoCal project really provides opportunities um, for them for water supply, um, either to serve as meeting a portion of their supply gap or, or possibly even more. So now I'm gonna launch a little bit into the uh, study itself and um, the study team and study approach that we're taking. So you can see here the project partners, SoCal Creek, the city, as well as the Regional Water Management Foundation. Um, we've also within our organizations, we've tried to really involve um, or take a, I guess a holistic look at this um, by involving our engineering folks, uh, our operations folks. So just really trying to collaborate um, and pull everybody's thoughts and ideas in because this is there's a lot of moving pieces to this. We're also supported by a pretty big team of um, consultants. Brown and Caldwell is the lead consultant on the study. And then we have um, other folks that are listed here that are providing um, really expert advice on, on those particular topics. The study approach is really using the um, groundwater and hydraulic modeling to, I mean, we started really large. We started looking at, you know, all of these different scenarios with the modeling um, and to use the modeling and the machine learning um, process that Cameron will talk touch on tonight to narrow down to what looks to be um, the most promising um, alternatives. From there, uh, and we've, we've completed that task for the most part, there's still a little bit more to do on the groundwater side and a few more things to model on the hydraulic side. And by the way, hydraulic modeling is really um, looking at our distribution systems for both of our water utilities and how um, these projects would impact that and whether we would need to upgrade um, water mains or um, booster pump stations or add new wells. So um, that's kind of a little bit of background on hydraulic modeling. And that's pretty much done. Um, from there, we have narrowed down to what we see as these bookend type projects, the four alternatives, and Cameron will go into more detail on those. But from there, we'll be taking those and really funneling, funneling them through and evaluating them for water quality compatibility. Um, we want to make sure that, um, you know, what we're doing uh, isn't, there's not uh, water age problems or um, corrosion issues with water quality um, as a result of the projects. We'll also be looking at them for their fi financial and economic um, uh, impacts. So how much are they going to cost and how much is that going to impact rates if they were implemented? There's also going to be an analysis for uh, how would we, for each project, how would we partner together um, for uh, interagency agreements and um, cost sharing? And then lastly, there's a needs, assess uh, needs assessment to look at the social, environmental, political, and legal um, aspects of the projects. 
Once those evaluations are complete, that information will be used to score the projects using weighted criteria and sub-criteria that we developed with um, the city uh, in conjunction with them. And that really stem from our prior water supply planning efforts, uh, both the district's community water plan and the city's um, securing our water future policy. So we're, we're building off of those criteria. Um, what we'll end up with is uh, relative benefits of the project projects, and so we can compare them for their benefits, and then we'll overlay the project benefits with the cost to look for the project that provides the most benefit at the lowest cost. That information will feed into a final report with work uh, recommendations and a work plan for any future action um, from there. I think just one one thing to note on that, and we had several slides. Uh, this slide deck is com condensed, even even with what we're presenting tonight. But just kind of a summary of that slide, you can see at the top we have a checkbox. So. That's kind of our task complete. The other ones are will be forthcoming. So there's been just a lot of time and effort related to the data part. That it's very data heavy, um, both with the groundwater modeling and then the infrastructure and the way to move water. So this is a over. It's about a two year study, right, Shelley? And so we we spent a lot of time just on that first part. How far into it are we? We really got started oh, last early winter, so we're a year, a little more than a year into it. Um, the modeling did, um, I think, take a bit longer because we did incorporate the machine learning process, and that produced a lot of options that we then had to pare down um, to get to where we are now. So a lot of... Uh, a lot of work went into that. And, mm -hmm. and then in terms of the hydraulic modeling or the infrastructure, we had to update our infrastructure hydraulic modeling. The city, city did it on their side, and then we had to integrate the two systems and then you know calibrate and, and make sure that, that it, the modeling was working. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cameron to talk to you about the approach for the modeling and the results. Thank you, Shelley. Can you get the video? Oh, thank you. So uh, I'll be talking about the groundwater modeling for the optimization study. That is the task that is mostly complete. But as you can see, that this is just a, a first step in the overall optimization study. Uh, so we'll kind of back up and review what was done for the GSP, how the planned projects were evaluated in the GSP and how we're trying to be consistent with that evaluation with our optimization study, specifically with the climate change scenario. Look at how groundwater sustainability benefits were assessed for the GSP of the planned projects. And this optimization study is really about what can be done with the planned projects to improve supply regionally and talk a little bit about the groundwater modeling role for, for the optimization study, how we evaluated with that groundwater modeling, different alternative tracks, which I'll be explaining, and, and which alternatives we select for the further evaluation for everything that is going to happen after the, the groundwater modeling. Uh, do a quick overview of how we use machine learning to help us with, with the groundwater modeling and identifying alternatives for, for evaluation and summarize the results of what has been selected for further evaluation. Next slide, please. So we are using for the optimization study the same climate star scenario used in the GSP, and this is important to be consistent with the GSP and the evaluations of sustainability that have been done to date. Uh, this is a climate scenario that is based off of historical climate where we use mostly the warmer years from the historical climate because we know that future climate will be warmer. Uh, turns out most of those warmer years are drier years, so this is a relatively dry scenario and includes 
uh, a three-year period, three years in a row of critically dry conditions, which is uh, conditions when the city has its greatest need for additional supply because its surface water supplies are not as great. It's actually part of a six-year period of relatively dry conditions. You can see the stress on the, the city supply during that, that period. We'll also be evaluating all of our results or our results that have been selected with the climate change scenario that the city primarily uses for its planning. They refer to it as realization uh, 1270. Next slide, please. Shelley uh, previewed this, but we have uh, planned projects in the groundwater sustainability plan. And the optimization study really looks at using these projects that are in the plan that achieve sustainability uh, for improving regional supply. And that's the city's aquifer storage and recovery project, uh, pure water SoCal, as well as transfers. Now in the GSP, the really focus on transfers from the city to the district. A lot of what we'll be doing for optimization is to look at transfers from the district to the city. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, the GSP showed that sustainability is achieved with the planned projects, but, and you need those planned projects to achieve sustainability. Uh, this is very similar to our last presentation in the last item, where we're comparing groundwater levels to sustainable man management criteria, like the minimum threshold represented by the dashed line, the groundwater levels needed to prevent seawater intrusion. And without projects, the undesirable results that we're observing now are, would ex be expected to continue. Those are the yellow line there. And so there's a need to raise groundwater levels beyond what's projected without projects with projects like ASR and Pure Water Soquel. So in the city area, uh, it is primarily ASR that helps achieve sustainability. And Pure Water Soquel also helps uh, achieve sustainability in this area by allowing a reduction of pumping from the shared aquifer unit uh, for both the city and SoCal. Next slide, please. Now, sustainability, GSP also shows sustainability in the district area achieved by Pure Water SoCal, similarly to the city area uh, without projects. The conditions that we've been observing recently as described in the last item of uh, water levels below sustainable management criteria, undesirable results of unacceptable risk of seawater intrusion, and represented by the yellow line or below the, the minimum threshold or sustainable management criteria needed to prevent seawater intrusion. Pure Water SoCal helps raise groundwater levels to achieve sustainability. This occurs both in the western area where the three seawater intrusion prevention wells inject purified water to help raise groundwater levels, as represented by the top hydrograph there uh, at a well in that area, and also in the southeastern area where there isn't injection, because the injection allows the district to redistribute its pumping and reduce pumping in the southeastern area to raise groundwater levels throughout the district and achieve sustainability. The plot also shows, the top plot near the injection shows that groundwater levels are projected to be increased well above what's needed to achieve sustainability. And that represents the potential for, potent, for possibly pumping more in that area to provide additional supply to regional partners like the city of Santa Cruz. Now, as described before, the GSP does discuss potential benefit of a transfer from city to the district. Uh, we'll and that has been reassessed as well as part of the optimization study. What we're looking at also is the potential supply benefits of transferring from the district to the city, taking advantage of the potential of Pure Water Soquel as demonstrated here. Next slide, please. So as mentioned before, uh, groundwater modeling is just a piece of this uh, overall optimization study. It's an initial step to I help identify alternatives uh, that can work in the, in the groundwater basin, and the alternative selectors will go on for further evaluation by the, the rest of the team. It is focused on the planned projects that are in the GSP and how those can be used to improve regional supply. Uh, it 
there are other things that the city of Santa Cruz are looking at that are not based in sustainable so supplemental supply projects, and that's not included in this optimization. It's focused on the mid-county basin. And so what we're doing with the groundwater modeling is to identify alternatives that are feasible in the groundwater basin and achieve basin sustainability. And we'll see what supply can be achieved uh, after meeting those requirements. There are some groundwater aspects that still need to be assessed, uh, such as those for permitting requirements, travel times related to the injection of purified water and other local impacts. And there will be an assessment of that um, as well. Cost estimates are not specifically incorporated. And so that's why we optimize by alternative track, which I'll describe uh, in a little bit. And we've been working in conjunction with the hydraulic modeling, the modeling of the distribution system uh, that show how water can be transferred between the two agencies. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned a couple of times, we evaluated and optimized along alternative tracks. And the reason we did this is because these alternative tracks really represent basic similar sets of project combinations that seem to represent different cost points because we're not optimizing to specific costs. We wanted to represent different potential cost levels of infrastructure that, that could be optimized and see what could be achieved with those different combinations as described by the alternative tracks. So we end up do, with uh, five new tracks to compare with what's basically in the GSP, which is ASR and Pure Auto Soquel without transfers. Track one is the two projects with transfers using existing infrastructure, the existing O'Neill Intertie allowing transfer from the district to city, but limited to what is there now. And then we go on to expansion of projects, uh, including transfers, expansion of aquifer, city's aquifer storage and recovery, as well as increasing the capacity of transfer between the agencies, uh, optimizing the existing 1,500 acre feet per year from Pier Water Soquel potentially with new wells as well as an increase in transfer capacity. There's then expanding pure water soquel. What can you do with expanding how much is treated and purified and injected in the ground with new wells? Uh, finally, we look at combinations of expanding ASR and pure water soquel. And so, we're able to, with the groundwater modeling along any of these alternative tracks, find alternatives that are feasible in the groundwater basin and can achieve sustainability. Question? Yes. Just wondering where the volumes for pure water SoCal came from, going up to 1,900 to 2,100. Yes. So this does represent uh, results of the modeling. To some degree, we tested different uh, levels of increases of pure water soquel capacity. Um, as you know, pure water soquel was designed with the potential for doubling the capacity. Um, and we wanted to see what levels could achieve the goals of, of what's feasible and sustainable while helping the city with its water supply gap. And we were able to do it with these levels. And so these represent the levels that achieve feasibility and sustainability in the groundwater basin and also uh, fill the supply gap that the city has. Okay, I just wondered why you didn't, Nick, so, so that kind was- like the lowest level of expansion. Okay, the lowest level that would achieve those goals. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yep. And since we're asking questions, what's the assumptions on the transfers from city to to uh, district and district to city? Yes, yeah, so under this track one, uh, based on projects with transfers, uh, we do have uh, include transfers from the city to district limited by existing infrastructure. Um, as we'll show in a little bit, the availability of that water is somewhat limited mm -hmm. and the benefit of that transfer is also limited. Okay. And so as a result, uh, we, Subsequent tracks do not include that based off of that 
finding. Um, we are looking, we are selecting four tracks, four alternatives from these tracks for further evaluation. So you know, we can find alternatives that work from the groundwater point of view. There are differences in how much supply they can provide for the city. Because this is, uh, a, we're trying to see, the city has an identified supply gap. And the projects meet what's planned for the district as far as supply and achieving sustainability. We're trying to see what can be done more to help with the city's supply. And depending on the level of infrastructures, there are different levels of supply that can be provided for the city. And we're selecting four alternatives that are worthy of evaluation, even at those different levels of supply. For the so city. is the assumption that there's 1,500 acre feet a year going to the basin, to the seawater prevention wells, and then that's why the, you, know, you, you expand the plant? Or is there, are you playing with different numbers for how much is being put back into the basin? Right. So a lot of what we're doing is a lot of, if you look at um, tracks one through three, it was trying to do as much as we can with, uh, with existing capacity of Pure Water SoCal, 1,500 acre feet per year. Uh, there is some potential for pumping more. Uh, from using existing pure water SoCal and then transferring to the city to help with their supply. And that helps somewhat um, to, fully, uh, to fully meet the supply gap while achieving sustainability. We did find a need to expand pure water SoCal. Okay. I think what- as, it, as, it, as, as the scenarios get you know, developed and played out, It'll be clear what what assumptions are made. I think one of the ways that the um, the technical team was explaining it to us is that there's a lot of these dials, right? We know we have Pure Water SoCal at uh, 1,500 acre feet per year treatment facility and three seawater intrusion prevention wells. The city has up, you know, there are four ASR wells, and then we have extraction wells. And I think one of the things that's really important for our um, evaluation of the projects and the dynamics of it, which is dissimilar to like say Southern California or other projects, They're, they have a groundwater replenishment system, they do the treatment, they're in charge of the, the injection wells, and they don't really have a lot of control with the wells that extract it. Those are five or seven or eight other different entities that pull water out. Here, we've got these dials of like, we have three wells, and then we have different extraction wells. Can we can we design it our system differently by how we extract, how we move water to and from? Before we say we have fifteen hundred acre feet, let's put more wells in and spread it out, just to try to I think optimize or minimize the capital infrastructure that the city and the district have put in, and then we looked at at kind of the water supply gap, and then moving the water. So I think really in a nutshell, like the option one was really about like the limitation of the valve in between us. And then options, you know, the other tracks kind of tweak those to kind of see if that wasn't the pinch point and we could transfer water, then how much more water could we optimize to shift around to help both the space and sustainability as well as the cities. And then and another layer is more city ASR wells, and another layer is expanding the treatment, and then kind of what we referred to at the technical level, these cross tracks, which was a little expansion of the city's ASR and a little expansion of pure water, and doing kind of like this, like the Goldilocks approach, the cross tracks. And then it seems like there's also all the variables of, well, where do you put those TWIP wells, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like yes. toward, yeah. towards the... Like you could put them near the city's where it needs or, yeah. And that's really where I think um, it got, you know, if I would use the word, and I would, Emma always thinks that Cameron's job is so cool um, because it goes through all the technical stuff, but that's where when we saw some of the um, examples and the scenarios from the machine learning, it really kind of ran through a lot more of those um, alternatives. 
So from these different alternative tracks that can be just considered different infrastructure levels, different cost points, there was a decision to select four alternatives within each of these tracks for a further evaluation. And the selection of these tracks aren't uh, selection of these alternatives aren't necessarily, well, this one will solve all our problems, so we should evaluate it further. A lot of it is based off of different comparisons that the agencies, including the city, want to do to assess different options as part of their, as a, as a part of the bigger picture for, uh, for water supply planning. So the alternative from track one with baseline projects with transfers does, does not uh, fill the full supply gap, but that's a good comparison point with what you can do with existing infrastructure and include the option of transfers from the city to the district. Uh, the Expand Cities ASR also doesn't uh, fill the supply gap. There are limits on how much expansion of city ASR can be do, but I think there is uh, to help the city with its supply gap, they want to understand what can be done with a focus of infrastructure on in, in their area, and, and that's with ASR. And then once we got into what are the alternatives that can fill the supply gap, we decided that it was really two different options where it was a combination of expansion of ASR and Pure Water SoCal, because there's still a, a motivation on the city side to maximize what it can do with ASR, uh, and then see what is necessary from Pure Water SoCal to, to fully fill the supply gap. So those are the four alternatives bolded uh, that will be moved forward for further evaluation. So how, how is sustainability, the effect of the different scenarios on sustainability evaluated? Yeah, so what we're doing is we're trying to find alternatives that meet sustainability, and, and that's what we'll be talking about in the next slides. Okay, yep. good. Next slide, please. And so what we did is we wanted to test many different alternatives, many different combinations and variations of projects. And so that was ended up in thousands of groundwater model simulations. Uh, and we had some ideas about what could be tried, but we needed some help to try many different things. And, and so that's where we would use some machine learning to guide us in trying different alternatives, trying different options. And the idea was finding alternatives that are both feasible and sustainable from a groundwater standpoint. And so the graph here is on the y-axis uh, metric of what's optimized, what can be feasible, sustainable, and achieve the most supply. Uh, and the lower number is more optimized. And we were able to uh, show you know, we were able to find a machine learning algorithm that improved over time, made things more optimized. Now, what are we trying to optimize? The, we are first really trying to find alternatives that are feasible in the groundwater basin and sustainable. By feasible, I mean, can you get, the, if you're doing injection, can you get the water uh, in the aquifers without water levels rising too high? You don't want water levels to rise too far high above ground surface. Then you're not able to get that water into the groundwater basin. You want to be able to get the water you need out of the groundwater at the well. So it's a, a evaluating the feasibility of, of the projects in the groundwater basin. And then sustainability. Can you make this, meet the sustainable management criteria that we've talked about in, in both of the last two, two items, uh, even as you pump more during the, the longer drought where the supply needs of the city are, are the greatest? And then once you find alternatives that are feasible and sustainable, how much supply does that meet? How much of the city supply gap is filled? And so if we can achieve all three of those things, it, it is fully optimized and we're able to improve things over time with, with the machine learning algorithm assisting us. Yep, all those dots are runs. Uh, there are different colors for different algorithms. Uh, the dark blue line and, and dots are the algorithm that is the algorithm that worked best in this case. Um, and it did require a little bit of experimentation and, and we did find something that, that helped us. So um, glad the efforts were, were useful. 
Next slide, please. So uh, getting to uh, President Jaffe's question about you know, which of these alternatives are sustainable, we're able to find alternatives that are sustainable uh, all amongst all the tracks. And every alternative that is moving forward is fairly sustainable. So these Hodge graphs show groundwater model results for the four alternative moving forward. Uh, there's examples of wells in the city area and all four alternatives are able to raise groundwater levels to be above minimum thresholds, above the sustainable management criteria, achieve sustainability. And in the drier periods when there's more pumping required to provide supply for the city, when their surface water supplies are less and during drier times, it has this room to draw down the basin while staying at or above these sustainable management criteria. So we can find things that work for sustainability from all these alternative tracks. Uh, you'll see later what the difference is in, in the ability to meet supply. Um, next slide, please. And we see the same thing in the district area. So in the district area, Pure Water Soquel, uh, whether at 1,500 acre feet per year or higher amounts, raise groundwater levels and allow uh, increased pumping during those drought times and stay above the sustainable management criteria uh, and achieve sustainability even as it provides more supply uh, transfers from the district to the city. So that big dip was a drought of significance? Yeah. Yep, the big dip is the drought uh, where the city has higher need for a uh, source beyond their, their surface water sources. And so this is in the big dip represents pumping to try to provide that supply. Uh, next slide, please. So we've been talking about the sustainable management criteria for seawater intrusion primarily. Uh, also looked at the effects of interconnected surface water and whether uh, sustainability can be achieved for the most part in comparison to those criteria. And for the most part, all these alternatives are able to do that. Uh, weren't as strict in uh, assessing these because these criteria will change uh, in, in the future. Uh, overall, we wanted to see that groundwater levels were at or higher than what they've been and are above the minimum thresholds for the most, time, most part. Next slide, please. So I just kind of want to take a pause. I think we have about four more slides of the modeling just to go through each of those four tracks that are narrowed down to the four alternatives where Cameron can kind of go and explain a little bit more related to what the limitations are, what the water transfers are, and then maybe about five slides of wrap up in the next steps. Do you want us to continue or shorten? I had maybe just take a quick pulse. The whole pack. Continue. Okay. So, um, we'll try and make it sound exciting. We also it have is, this. It is exciting, but it's. Can you long. also yes. send us the slides later because yeah, I'd like to look in more detail. Yeah. Yeah. It, I hate to shorten such a massive amount of it's an important thing. Going into how much. So I'll, I'll just quickly go through each of the four alternatives that are moving forward and um, what they mean on the supply end of things. So alternative, the alternative from track one, which is uh, using the existing projects, transfers with no upgrades, their, their DES this fill some of the supply gap, uh, transfers fill some of the supply gap, but uh, there is still a remaining gap in the peak drought year of, of 425 million gallons. So it doesn't completely uh, solve the problem, um, but does show the benefit of, of transfers. Tom? I didn't understand supply gap versus remaining gap. Um, so remaining gap is what's left after whatever they're getting from ASR and transfer. Yeah. Okay. So the supply gap before um, any groundwater projects is this in this peak drought year of 1110 million gallons. Um, ASR is able to provide 425 transfers from the district is able to provide 260 
and then that's still 425 left over. And that transfer is from the district to the city, no transfer to the district on this one. Well, this one does include a limited transfer from the city to the district. Yeah, yeah, um, which we have a next slide. I know, we don't know how to take that off. Um, but we have more detail on the next slide about that specific issue. Uh, I think it, it is worth quickly covering in the next slide um, about our, our evaluation of limited transfers from the city to the district. Uh, this is related to uh, H, uh, Habitat Conservation Plan rules about what the city can do with its surface water. There is more flexibility for uh, using the water for ESR injection and more limitations on transfers. Uh, there is a priority for doing ASR injection. And after you do an ASR, inje ASR injection, there's actually just a, a few times when transfers can take place. It's actually, yeah, so in this climate scenario, it's 11 months and 53 years. On average, that's six acre feet per year. And based off of that number, you wouldn't expect much benefit to groundwater in the hydrograph shows the very minimal uh, change in groundwater level with that, that transfer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, just quickly provide the, the outlines of what the different alternatives that are moving forward. Expanded ASR includes a fifth ASR well, uh, one new one. Uh, we did find that there were limits on being able to add additional ASR wells uh, feasibly and sustainably uh, in, the, in the basin. This does increase transfer for the district to do as much as possible to, to reduce the supply gap. But in the peak drought year, there is still a remaining gap of, of 290 million gallons. Uh, still, this is a uh, alternative worth moving forward, especially as the city considers um, all its options for for supply. Then we go to two expanded, uh, two, two alternatives that expand both projects, and one uh, is a more limited expansion, while one expands it greater. Both of these are able to achieve, uh, eliminate the supply gap. Um, this one adds a new injection well that injects the increased capacity of the Pure Water Soquel project increased in by 400 acre feet per year, and also adds a new ASR well. Um, so more is able to be extracted by the city. Uh, the new injection by Pyotr Sakel also supports increased pumping by the district to help transfer water from the district to the city and eliminate the supply gap. And then finally, uh, we have another alternative, uh, which also eliminates the supply gap. And the reason why we, I want to look at this other alternative is this option of adding more capacity of pure water soquel, uh, adding additional wells. Um, and the locations that we found work best were for injection wells for pure water soquel are up at Energy and Cummings Park. And part of that is uh, because of the higher land surface elevation, so there's more room to get water in. And it's also near the city, so the city's wells, including their new ASR wells, can benefit from that injection. So there's more freedom of the city to extract uh, from their side of, of the boundary and not require transfer. And so this option increases the injection, increases the wells to, to reduce the transfer amount. And we'll be able to compare what the infrastructure needs of increasing transfer versus adding new wells, how those compare from a cost point of view and other considerations. And so again, this gap is eliminated, but the transfers uh, are down to 400 million gallons in the, in the peak year. And that was the same location in the previous track? Yeah, generally they're the same locations. Um, we're looking at, you know, we found and guided by machine learning saying try this and it worked out what were uh, new pure water soquel injection wells in Anagen Cummings and new ASR wells in uh, the Capitol, Capitola Mall area. So um, let me make sure I'm understanding this. 
at the purple squares are in injection wells. So is that correct? Well, I, I should have uh, introduced that. Um, the purple squares are uh, locations that, in model cells, but locations that the district has identified as potential sites for new pure water SoCal wells, while the orange locations are sites that the city have identified for new ASR wells. So what we, what we did and machine learning did was test potential injection and extraction at these different locations. And from our simulations, we found that the injection wells at Anna Jean Cummings Park for Pure Water Soquel and Capitola Mall for City of Santa Cruz work the best. And that's why those alternatives are moving forward for further evaluation. So the, these are just potential wells and then um, they're not all going to be built if it's just doing sensitivity to these different locations. Right. So those are all uh, basically location options. And for this alternative, uh, the alternative includes two well, new wells for the district in very similar locations and two new wells for the city um, in the Capitola Mall area. Um, so they're kind of pairs in, in different aquifer units. And the groundwater modeling did sh show that this had a promise and was able to eliminate supply gap and limit the amount of transfers required. And you're showing a subset of the, the model grid that you evaluate for the entire model grid? No, that's right. Um, and th there are actually more sites that the district identified as potential well sites. Um, this is all kind of showing what's in the area near the city. Uh, we also had additional sites that were evaluated closer to the existing Pure Water SoCal wells and a little bit farther east of that. Okay. Oh, and Cameron, can I ask a quick question too? Um, you'd mentioned there are limits to, you know, adding the new ASR wells. And I was wondering if you could just talk me through really quickly what the parameters are for that. Yes. So um, when we look at adding ASR wells, um, we did run into limits on the ability to inject at additional ASR wells, uh, running into groundwater levels running too high. But really, uh, the bigger factor was the point of adding these ASR wells is really to extract more to provide the city with more supply. And once you get to adding those wells to try to do that, uh, it was bringing groundwater levels too low and we weren't able to maintain sustainability. And so we found that we were really limited to adding the single uh, ASR well. Now, this alternative you see on your screen adds two ASR wells. And you may ask, well, how was that achieved? And that's achieved yeah. with the help of the expanded pure water SoCal. By injecting more uh, up in the same vicinity, but up at Energy Commons Park, you're able to raise groundwater levels overall and allow the city to extract from two wells uh, supported by the additional ASR injection from surface water supply as well as the purified water injection. So the limit really on the ASR expansion is, is related to groundwater sustainability. As I recall, one key factor in all this is that it's a leaky system. That, if, that you do need to continually put water into it, otherwise the water levels go too low. That, that's, that's right. We need to uh, continue to put water in. Previous modeling showed that if we just stop pure water SoCal, that groundwater levels would drop um, pretty quickly, that it needed to be a continuous ongoing supply. And that's because you need an ongoing flow offshore to prevent seawater intrusion. I think I think we have one last summary slide, which walked us through all of that, and then probably Shelley, we could maybe just end there. Yeah, I have a, just a couple questions. Yeah, so this just summarizes what I just went through. You know, different infrastructure levels um, actually able to increase ASR supply and um, 
have different levels of transfer from the different district to the city. Um, alternatives that are moving forward include two alternatives that do not completely fill the city supply gap um, and two alternatives that do. And so those are four alternatives that will uh, move on for further evaluation with the optimization study. I need to keep asking questions because I know I'm, I'm lengthening things, but um, you know, the city had listed um, DPR somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Is that, I, I'm curious like how that fits into the thinking of all of this optimization. Um, so for what we've done, it, it has not. And so um, what we've done is like, what can we do with the Mid-County Basin? So using the groundwater resource and, and the, the storage potential of, of the groundwater Basin. The city, as part of its planning, is, is considering DPR. So if they go with something such as something that doesn't fill the supply gap, that's an option for them to, to fill the rest of it. Yeah. And, and similar to how Santa Margarita Basin could be used as well. So Thank you. I'll gladly to pass it over to Shelly to, to wrap us up. Thank you, Cameron. Really appreciate you coming down two nights in a row um, for the city last night and tonight for us. This is really helpful. So um, these are just some next steps that we plan to take um, now that we're mostly completed. The modeling efforts, um, we're really kind of embarking on the, the cost analysis of the infrastructure that will be needed, the water quality analysis, and then that'll kick off the financial and economic evaluation and the um, environmental needs assessment work. And then this is just a, a schedule uh, of where we are right now, um, right here, finishing up these technical modeling tasks and then moving into the other technical tasks to ultimately go into the final report, um, which we're looking at uh, finishing that up in, in 2025. And then lastly, thank you. Um, I know that was a lot. It's also super exciting that we can actually achieve sustainability. Yeah. yeah. For, and, for both. I mean, that's... And regional. Cool. Yeah, regional. For the whole region. Sustainability. Just an astounding amount of hard work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's no uh, board actions tonight. It's informational update. All right. Are there any? It's time for public comment. It's an informational item, so um, there's not any action required of the board. But I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Um, you started my clock early, but thank you. Um, the your question about how does the water uh, really support? the districts and, and the mid counties based on sustainability. If you look in the packet, actually some of Mr. Cameron's, uh, Mr. Tana's work is in the optimi not the optimization, but the, um, the contract with CH2M Hill. On page 1069, it, talk it shows about that, the fate of the injected water in the year 2047. And uh, in the A unit, 59% would remain in the unit, 37% would be captured by wells. In the BC unit, 4% would remain in the unit, and 0 0.01 would be captured by the wells. So I, d I don't quite understand how this comports with what we're hearing tonight, and I would appreciate some discussion about that. Um, I think that I, I'm glad to hear that the district is looking at costs as the next step. Um, and I was a little concerned to see that they were not considered in any of the modeling, nor did I hear anything in the modeling about the impacts of these new wells on um, private wells nearby. On the uh, holding times, has that been modeled for um, being able to use them if these new wells go in where they are, are uh, maybe going to be, and um, I forget the third part. <laughs> um, 
I, I really think that you should not downplay the winter storage, winter transfers. It, it may seem unreliable compared to the Pure Water SoCal and the ASR, but, but it, is a, it is an effort that can be made and should not be minimized. Thank you. All right. I'll have to send some written comment, so I will Please do, do that because Please that was a very long presentation. Of course. A lot of good information. Thank you. I'd like to see an equal time presentation with Becky Steinbrenner on the problems with this project that she has thoroughly researched. We just viewed um, Soquel, Pure Water, Santa Cruz, Public Relations, which I translate to be toxic poop sewage, sewage water propaganda. Seems like you're playing God. Would God inject poisons into the aquifers? I think not. Modeling is not reality. It's just computer modeling. Poisoning the water is not sustainable. Scientifically valid, I heard that phrase, not at all. False premises, false solutions is what I heard. Reminds me of fracking, what you're doing. Where is the proof of no harm, that nothing will go wrong? We have some lessons from history, examples of other safe, cost-effective, sustainable projects like nuclear power plants, so inexpensive, can't, don't need to monitor it. We have Fukushima, Three Mile Island, on and on, nuclear power plants that can't be cooled with all the droughts, the brittle nuclear power plants. Also, Roundup, Monsanto's, oh, so safe, sprayed on everything, poisoning Monsanto lawsuits of people dying of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, I offer an alternative. Please cancel you, this hazardous, dangerous Marilyn, project. Please, please be respectful. Thank you. I'm... Oh, it says I have saved. Thank you, Marilyn. Seven minutes, seconds. The W.C. Fields quote. No. Oh. Okay. All right. So information only. So thank you and. Look forward to more updates as, as things move along. Um, any other comments from? I just like to I'd like again to just like to see the slides. Yeah, that'd be good. I just like to say again, thank you. I know that was long, um, but I think it's been highly anticipated for that information. And thank you to Heidi. I know you both, you and Cameron. This is double duty for you in two days, so thank you. Okay, that brings us to agenda item 7.4. Um, I'll make this very short and sweet. Thank um, you. This, I have okay. this one. Um, we're asking the board to uh, tonight adopt resolution 24-08, honoring Public Service Recognition Week um, and uh, celebrating the fine work and amazing staff that we have at Soquel Creek Water District um, and, and serving their public, so. All right. Are there any public comments specifically on this item? Seeing none, what's the motion? I'll second. All right. Roll call. Dire Director Balboni? Yes. Vice President Lather? Yes. Director LeHue? Yes, and we do appreciate all of the public service that they give. Director Christensen? Yes, and thank you. <laughs> President Jaffe? Yes, and thank you very much. All right, so that brings us not to adjourn. adjourn. Yes, I know. <laughs> well, the minutes, okay, 4.1, yeah. 
So, Kenzie, you do you want to? Four point one. I pulled four point one. There was just there was a, a little correction that needed to be made that she's got up here. Yeah. So in track track changes, you can see that um, there was a duplication in the director comments between seven point two and seven point three. Um, I made those corrections in track changes. You can see that I deleted a portion and then added the correct comments. So those will be revised in the next, in the final minutes. Okay. Should, can we approve them without having a chance for everybody to read the changes? Okay. I think if um, we can, you know, in terms of explaining what we did, just to, I think what, what Mackenzie said, Substantially, we had some duplicative comments. So what we'll do is we'll strike it out to make sure that the comments related to the director's um, comments on the topic, one for the leak adjustment policy and then the other one for the for the rebate item, uh, correlates to the appropriate item. Okay. Any public comment on this before we vote? Seeing none. Motion? I'll move. Okay. The correction, they correct with, with corrections. Tom, do you want a second? Since second you? since. <laughs> okay. All right. I heard it. A roll there. call. Director Balboni. Yes. Vice President Lather. Yes. Director LaHue. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. President Jaffe. Yes. That brings us to four point five. Item 4.5 is the reaffirmation of the Jacobs contract. And if you have any questions. Any questions? I just uh, I just brought it back for public comment so it could be uh, pulled it off of consent. OK, and any public comment on this? Nikki Steinbrenner, thank you for pulling this from the consent agenda. I do not believe that you can approve the resolution um, in the packet tonight because it is incomplete. I put side by side resolution 24.04 that you approved on March 5th with the one in your packet 24.07. And 20, the one um, that you're Wanting to approve tonight is incomplete. Um, it does not include uh, section three through six that your former resolution did that included the costs and a lot of other important things. There's been no discussion about what these changes are in the reduction in the fixed cost component for the service fee that would save the district money. I would like uh, to have, uh, I would like to continue this item for next time with a better explanation of this, but you cannot approve the um, resolution because it is not complete. Um, I also want to, for the record, give you a, a protest letter and um, the, um, the item says that there is no new information, there are no new mitigations, and that is not true. Um, your board has received letters from the uh, Sierra Club saying that uh, there are problems. And so I believe that you need to look at, look at that in earnest before you approve them. Um, the... Um, up the, up the wording and the two um, resolutions are different, so you're not reaffirming them. You're, you're doing a new one. Thank the, you very much, Becky. All right, I would like to uh, give a copy for the record and a copy for the um, president of the board. And uh, I protest this because it is not right. You cannot approve it tonight, and I ask that you continue it. Thank you, Becky. So. Welcome. Any comments from directors? Oh, there's another oral. 
Yes, I also ask that you continue this item and not approve it, a 10-year contract. I mean, just reading this, adopt resolution 2007 to reaffirm, ratify, pursuant to the previously certified Pure Waters SoCal Environmental Repract impact report and previously adopted agenda entering into a service contract for operation and maintenance at risk services for the pure water SoCal advanced water purification facility. This is for 10 years. This needs to be on the regular agenda and well publicized and that you ratify this before even reading the contract, the, the whole project is appalling to me and it reminds me of this book called Toxic Sludge is Good for You, Lies, Damn Lies in the Public Relations Industry. We're dealing with toxic technology here that and it, it should not be going on. I call for this to be rescheduled on a regular agenda. I, I really don't know how in good conscience you can approve this kind of Thank you, Marilyn. agenda. Items. So there's been some allocation, allegations here about differences. Yeah, we um, think, do you want to talk about that? Sure. We think uh, everything is in alignment, but what I recommend is we just take about a two-minute pause um, to confirm something. Okay. okay. We will take a two-minute pause. President Jaffe, would it be okay if I briefly respond to some of the issues that were raised during public comment? Yes, it would be okay. Ron is, Ron, Josh would like to respond to some of the issues that were, were brought up. Um, so the revisions to the resolution that were referenced during public comment, um, those were made because the, those prior um, provisions are no longer relevant, um, given that we've included a copy of the contract itself within the packet um, as well. Um, in addition, some of the discussions about um, costs and other things, those are actually handled in the contract itself. And again, um, that was included in the packet. Um, and so those prior uh, discussions in the previous resolution just simply aren't, aren't applicable. Um, so staff is comfortable with the board moving forward this evening if you'd like to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Becky, Becky, this, no, Becky, Becky, stop it. Please stop be it, respectful. Becky. Stop Please it. Please be respectful. Stop it, Becky. Would, you've had your say. Stop it. You're being disruptive. You're being disruptive of the meeting. And you'll be asked to leave. Please be respectful. Please be respectful. Okay, let's ignore it. I'll, I'll move approval. Roll call. Second, sorry, I didn't have it on. Director Balboni. Yes. Vice President Lather. Yes. Director LeHue. Yes. Director Christensen. Yes. President Jaffe. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Number eight, adjournment.